Uh, we we help our clients find a faster way to do things. How about <laughs> <laughs> this is robotics, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Automation. You know. Uh, Not real. Uh, we don't do physical robots, mind you, but we, you know, it's all software. So, so are you making robots what smarter, more efficient, or helping people actually? Yeah, no, we we help people find uh, you know more efficient processes and then where they can automate to eliminate waste and uh, manual effort. And, uh, you know, Got there's it. sort of an interesting, yeah, I mean, you know, that's the, and if, if you say instead of robotics, if you just say robotic automation, you know, or there we go. Close Occasionally and I get people calling you want to talk about real robots that lift things and drop things and, like we do imaginary Perfect. robots. <laughs> RPA. Right. There you go. Great. Uh, well, uh, we don't have Greg in, but it is now time. Uh, right. And so uh, I, we're now, we're live um, and streaming. Uh, and so we have uh, our, our group here right now, the five of us. Uh, and so I think it's good to just get started, uh, since some of this will be watched live and some of it will be, uh, pre-recorded. So, uh, or, or seen after the fact. So now that we've seen how the sausage is made, uh, in putting our panel together, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to invite everyone, uh, uh, to, uh, to hear from our panelists. Uh, we have been tasked with the very, very, uh, unique question of can digital technologies actually make us better human beings? Uh, which uh, for me, I think was really interesting because uh, it makes for an interesting question. We live in this time now where we really think, uh, you know, we generally, there seems to be this feel that, uh, that technology feels a little bit dark. Uh, and uh, while uh, I didn't quite grow up in the sort of uh, joy of say the sixties of we're all just about to live in space and technology is going to solve all of our problems. Uh, I happen to live in Seattle, which is home to the World's Fair in that period, but the home of the Space Needle. Uh, and all uh, it was very, very clear that everyone was just getting ready to move to some sort of uh, space condo uh, in that decade. Uh, but now we live in a time where as we look at technology, we're looking at just moments of civil unrest, of widespread unchecked misinformation, uh, there's a lot of fear. There's a fear around AI where we, uh, a lot of people don't even seem to understand it, but there's fear around it. Uh, and of course, fear around automation uh, and its impact on the workforce. Uh, but we also live in a moment when uh, the world of biotechnology has allowed us to uh, start getting little injections that are going to save us from uh, a pandemic that none of us have really seen before. Uh, it's like, so it's, uh, it is an interesting moment to have this question. But I think the topic is really interesting. I mean, uh, who's ever sitting and writing these topics came up with this question, can digital technologies make us better human beings? And that for me just begged one question, which is what's a better human being? Uh, we, uh, you know, is it a happier and more healthier human being? Because that's what I was thinking. Uh, and then when we all gathered together a few weeks ago, uh, we had a lot more questions like, is this a, a more productive worker? Uh, is it a more contributing member of society? Uh, could it be a more compliant and conforming human being who could just make all of our lives much easier? Uh, is it a human being that lives longer uh, and perhaps forever? Uh, or is it a less polluting or environmentally damaging human being? Uh, so these are all interesting questions and, and briefly thought, oh, maybe we should narrow this a little bit uh, so that we can be more focused. But it was very, very clear that this is going to get a lot more interesting and provocative uh, if we actually allowed each of us to, uh, to, uh, to move through these questions. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to cover topics like meaningful work, sustainability, access and democratization, bias built in. And I hope in the end we're going to come to some meaningful conclusions, uh, but certainly have a lot of fun as we do this. Uh, so we, uh, we, we have our panelists here, uh, and we're going to go uh, one by one. Uh, everyone gets three or four minutes to, to kind of talk, so you get a lightning round at the very beginning, uh, sharing their perspectives on this question. 
Uh, and then, uh, and then I'll do my best to limit my own questions. And then in the end, uh, I think from our panelists, we'll be asking each other questions. Uh, I have some to share. And then if, uh, if there's anyone uh, who wants to raise their hand, uh, please go ahead uh, and do that. Um, so uh, on my list, I'm going to kind of go around the horn here as I, I see. Uh, first off, I want to hear from, uh, from Trista Bridges. So Trista is a principal and co-founder at, at Read the Air uh, in, uh, in Japan. And she's been focused on helping businesses to build sustainability uh, into their business models. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure having a profound effect with that. So uh, Trista, the, the floor is yours. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Great, thanks so much. Um, I think in terms of this question, you know, it's it, like you, you, you said it kind of in the setup, it's a very profound one. Um, coming at this from a perspective of sustainability, th there's a few things that we kind of worry about and are concerned about, right? In terms of, you know, how do we help our world kind of move into a situation where it's less depletative, where um, we can actually, you know, make sure we work within the boundaries that we have in terms of our environment? Um, how can we make sure that we are become better human beings by interacting better with each other, taking better care of the planet? And there's actually some real significant blockers to being able to do that. Um, one being behavior, right? Our behavior is often um, a little bit counterproductive. Uh, we don't like to change so much. We find it very difficult to, um, that's the first thing. Secondly, we have incentives that are absolutely misaligned in many situations um, and cause many, many issues in terms of motivation, right? So if I take action X, what am I gonna get for it? If I don't do action Y, what happens? So the carrots and sticks, we don't really do a good job yet of putting those in place to deal with the issue of sustainability in our world. Um, but the third one is really technological solutions, right? Um, we don't yet have enough great technologies to help us realize this world. So, you know, I am not, by training a technologist. I have worked in tech space in different capacities, but I, I, I absolutely fundamentally realize that these three parts of the equation absolutely are critical to making sure that we can get to this kind of new world that we mentioned. So what is a better human being? In my opinion, it's a human being that is certainly productive. We talked, you talked a little bit about productivity, not at risk, um, can be able to contribute to society, not discriminated against, um, all of these types of things really make us better as human beings. And I think that the technology, you know, when we think about technology, we think automatically these days of, you know, the fangs, as we call them, right? You know, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. But technology is so much broader than that. And I think we forget that all of the things that kind of help us exist today <laughs> uh, rely on technology. And I think Getting out of this pandemic in many ways is going to require change of behavior, but it's also going to require technology. You know, do we know where the people are who, who are struggling with the disease? How can we get them health care in order to address them? Technology can be a real enabler of helping us get through that. So I think those are just some of my initial thoughts in terms of how we think about um, this issue and the importance of technological solutions for helping us move forward. Oh, that's super helpful. And, you know, sort of one question, we're going to get into this a little bit farther, but, you know, it seems like we're shining a bright light. You know, one of the areas you brought up is, is, is discrimination uh, and technology, at least growing up watching Star Trek. I thought like, oh, with technology, we're going to uh, be, uh, you know, much more one. Uh, and it seems like, uh, you know, that there, that there is an opportunity for technology to, to, to reduce discrimination, but at the same time, uh, it's fanning the flames, uh, perhaps, or maybe it's just shining a bright light. So we'd love just a quick take on that. Let me go back to it later. Oh, so for me, sorry, I didn't know if you were going to If you don't mind. No, no, no I, I agree with you, absolutely. I mean, I am deeply disturbed and troubled by, you know, I grew up in a time, you know, I'm a, very much a Gen Xer. I grew up in a time where we were creating all these incredible technologies and we thought you know, they had so much potential and to see some of the things that have happened are, are very disturbing to me for many reasons, obviously. Um, but I think also you know, our job as, as human beings, being able to reason and think and create is to get beyond this, right? And so we have a, a moral responsibility and a duty to get beyond this. And I believe we are capable of it. We just need to kind of maybe go back a little bit to basics and kind of just figure this out and really think about accountability 
think about ethics and think about the impact that some of the things that we're doing with technology is going to have on the world. So, you know, I'm not a technological ethicist again, but there's some very, very bright people who can help us think through kind of putting in place systems that deal with some of these issues. Perfect. Thanks for the quick take. Uh, great. So in our lightning round, next up we have Scott, it's Scott Francis. Uh, so Scott is CEO of BP3. Uh, so he's in this world of robotics, helping to find efficiencies in the world of robotics. Uh, and uh, he's going to he's going to address. Hopefully uh, we we'll, we'll see what you bring. I, I, I know there's that uh, automation and automating jobs always comes up. But uh, I, for one, uh, do not fear the robots. I look forward to their rule of society. So uh, so yeah. bring us up to date, Scott. What's the quote? I, for one, look forward to our robot overlords, something like that. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of fear around automation and especially when we start to anthropomorphize with words like robots and an ideal in the world of sort of software, robotic process automation uh, type of software where you have uh, software that emulates the way a human would interact with the software. So it types in the fields and it clicks the buttons the same way a person would, but faster mm -hmm. because you know, it doesn't have to actually hit the keys on the keyboard. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, we tend to think about that then, okay, but then the robot is going to replace the person. But we don't really produce generalized automation that does everything a human does. We produce really specialized automation that does like one narrow slice of a job and it does it really well at scale. And so if you think about it, you know, the economic case for like a robot that's going to re-roof your house is not great, right? There's not a great economic, you know, Com compelling economic argument to build that robot. But the nail gun, boy, there's a really good economic argument for the nail gun in the hands of a generalist human on the roof, you know, nailing down your roofing. I mean, that works really well. And I think the that analogy can be taken sort of to extremists, but I think the basic point is we really should think about AI and robotics as augmenting or assisting human intelligence and capability rather than replacing. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it that way, there are lots of economic use cases that are really clear. And when you think about replacing, the cost goes way up to produce that outcome and the applications narrow because you can't address these sort of surprises, you know, uh, that you find in the real world. So, you know, for example, when I think about fully autom autonomous driving, I'm a skeptic of that outcome. I think it's farther out than people think it is if it's possible. Um, and it's not clear it's desirable, right? I'd just rather have my car tell me when I'm about to do something unsafe or warn me that somebody is in my blind spot or things like that, that make me a better driver rather than thinking about how to make me a more passive driver. And, uh, you know, of course I also am an odd duck in that I enjoy driving and not everybody does. So um, right. the, the other thing I'd say is uh, the other fear is that look, as we increase the level of digitization or automation will displace jobs. And I think that that word is probably a good word, right? Displace because it, it, it shuffles the deck in terms of where the jobs are, what kinds of jobs there are. And that's where I think a lot of fear comes from. But uh, if you look at, for example, Amazon, they bought Kiva systems, I think 10 years ago, which is a warehouse robot automation system. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. But they have uh, 10 years ago, they had about 33,000 employees and now they have over 1.2 million employees. And so it's hard to argue that Amazon hasn't hired more people because of the capabilities that they've enabled through automation. And, and then I'll just take one more quick example, um, which would be, uh, you know, if you look at, well, just the, the vaccines produced uh, over the last year, the amount of time it took for, for these companies to sequence the genome of the virus was, you know, like 40, 48 hours or less because of automation of that process, right? It used to take much longer to sequence a gene, genome, but they've really improved the process and automated it. And uh, and then the design of the vaccine was just a couple of days. And the rest of the time is all testing and efficacy and safety, which is kind of amazing when you think about how much of that has been automated versus kind of historical comparisons. And so I think my my case would be that these automations, the, the challenge is the sudden disruption which we've all experienced for various reasons in the economy, COVID last year or the dot-com bust uh, 20 years ago. When there's a sudden dislocation, lots of people end up without work and it's very disruptive and hurtful to people. But when the disruption is more gradual, people have time to adapt, to find those other jobs. And then I think you just have this tension between, uh, are we automating things that nobody wants to do? That would be good, right? Like eliminate this menial work that nobody really wants those jobs. But then the other tension is the concern of, 
are they capable of doing other jobs, right? Or are we moving the bar to a point where they just don't have the opportunity to participate? And that's a tension I see people really fear or worry about. But I, you know, I, I tend to be on the optimistic side. I think we'll keep creating jobs that are really interesting and more fulfilling than the jobs that we're losing over the long haul. No, I think that's everyone's hope, of course. Uh, clearly, there's, uh, I feel like all the advances that we've had from previous uh, uh, industrial revolutions, it, in the long run and in the macro, it seems to work out. In the short run and in the micro, uh, there can be a lot of pain. Uh, and right. I think it's good, it's good to be eyes open uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and make sure we take both of those views. So it's interesting that you brought up the the vaccine, which may or may not be what Karthik is going to talk about. Uh, but Karthik uh, is uh, he's the chief digital officer at Invite, so he is working on uh, basically bringing genetics to the mainstream uh, and uh, into mainstream mainstream medicine. And so, curious, uh, we can dive into anything that you want, but you know, at some point, we're going to talk about uh, about vaccines. Yeah, absolutely, we do, and uh, yeah, our uh, uh, the team's done incredible work uh, within on on enabling testing capabilities as well. Um, going back to can digital technologies make us better human beings? I, I love the fact Dave, that you started up with uh, define a better human being, and I'm going to you know mush that up with uh, something Trista mentioned, which is you know it, about bringing fairness and equity. So uh, you know. The spurred in my head, the better human being is one who wants uh, who wants to participate in a society uh, that is more equitable. So the desire to participate in society that is more equitable, which leads to three reasons uh, why technology can be an enabler. And I'm, I'm a diehard optimist about these things. I'll talk about the dark side in a minute, but the, the three main reasons towards the fulfillment of being in that equitable society. One is democratization. Technology is this huge power of democratizing and leveling the playing field uh, that was that may or may not have been uh, available to previous generations uh, within that. Uh, if you think about uh, everything that has been uh, centralized to going to a federated model, access to capabilities, be it uh, creative capabilities like building music, uh, uh, you know, builders of music or software, the gig economy, et cetera, within that, um, or whether it is actually making money with uh, virtual currency technology, et cetera, it's democratized and leveled the playing field uh, such that like intrinsic advantages are gradually being shaped off, uh, I hope. Uh, the second piece is uh, inviting uh, humans to collaborate better. Um, so you do this once again through gig economies or by uh, collaboration tools that we have that uh, break uh, cultural and geographic boundaries that we may not have had the possibility of interaction in the past. Uh, And then the third big piece uh, of bringing goodness uh, to humanity is it unlocks creativity by, uh, uh, to to some extent, what Scott said, unlocks creativity by gradually eliminating drudgeries, eliminating waste, improving utilization. Um, Just as you said, like we, are in the business of sequencing and interpreting genetic test results. On the other side of the results is is a a patient who, who has some kind of an illness or a couple that's in an exciting phase of their life, ready to have uh, start a family. In either of those scenarios, technology and automation powered by uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, analytics capabilities is shortening that time and therefore offering a much better chance of survival, of cure, of increased happiness, uh, et cetera, to you know, protect you and your loved ones. So to summarize it, one is democratization, two is inviting uh, humans to collaborate better with each other, and uh, third is unlocking creativity by, by eliminating, um, eliminating waste in the system or accelerating uh, results. Um, obviously, the, the big risks that we all want to watch out for is there is potential bias in humans, and therefore that potential bias in humans is transmitted to the technology. And uh, you know, if done very carefully, it can actually neutralize and remove the bias. If done flippantly, it becomes a double-edged sword. And then the second piece is uh, you, you, we need to make sure that the, it, the spirit of democratization means that the access is not controlled. And if in this new mm-hmm. world you still perpetuate that the haves and the have-nots, 
then we've not done our job in leveraging com- uh, technology to democratize things. So there are dark sides to it that, that we constantly need to stay focused on mitigating. But as I said, I'm a diehard optimist in terms of deploying technologies that can truly transform worlds and make us better human beings. Great. Uh, thank you on that. You know, it's interesting on your middle point around uh, around getting people to collaborate. Uh, the one thing I heard a year ago, you know, we're now one year into a quarantine, is that oh, there's certain things you can do remote, uh, but there's a lot of things that you can't. And the number one I always heard is like, can't be creative together. You know, people can be productive, but can't uh, actually create. You, know, you have to sit in the room together. You have to, you know, connect and move through that. Uh, what do you say to that now, a year later? Uh, I think the intensity of the statement uh, is exponentially reduced over time. So, uh, and that is the power of creativity is that there are no constraints and the constraints are all perceived. So, uh, you know, things like uh, mirror boards and mural boards and list charts, like, you know, you yep. just take this, for example. Uh, I was uh, taking a screenshot of our esteemed colleagues here within this and I never knew Rasis could run this effectively. Uh, I was looking forward to a trip to Lisbon, but that's fine. I mean, this uh, works as well uh, from my home office. So, so I, I, I highly doubt if uh, if that statement will have validity over time. Um, we want to tend to go back and being social by choice uh, uh, and <clears throat> of our own volition. But the fact that this is ineffective or will continue to be ineffective and you have to pump flesh for you to, you know, make contact is, uh, I think that will lose validity uh, in very fast order. That's my personal perspective. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you. I have, to, I have to throw in there, though, that the Nantas are not nearly as good when you're remote as when you're in Lisbon. So. <laughs> good, good point. Next year in Lisbon. All right, so uh, the, our, uh, our, our final first presenter is, is actually Matt Spence, who is billed for what he's not and not what he is or what he, I guess, I guess you're still former U.S. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, which being a Deputy Assistant Secretary doesn't sound like the greatest aspiring to title, uh, but we know that you were doing uh, great things. This is what the government uh, does to our titles. Uh, he is now a managing partner, uh, managing director at Guggenheim Partners. He's teaching at Arizona State's Thunderbird School. Uh, my mom, who was the first uh, college graduate from her, uh, uh, from her family, went to Arizona State. So we have uh, Sun Devil Blood uh, uh, coursing through. So thanks for carrying the torch there and enjoying a very warm, if uh, COVID-filled pandemic. Uh, so uh, Matt, we'd love to hear your remarks. Oh. I think we have no audio for you, though. So while he's getting going, uh, because it looks like you're not muted. uh, So, uh, Matt, if you need to pop out and pop back in again, we're going to keep going. But I want you to interrupt me as soon as uh, as your audio comes on. Uh, So I want to jump into a few questions here. and uh, one is just really around um, uh, is around bias, right? So uh, half of us brought up the topic, so I think it's it's good to see. I think there's always this view of uh, of how we can introduce uh, experiences where there is less bi- bias. I think we're all familiar with the with the study of uh, of orchestras uh, that have been predominantly uh, male. Uh, that as soon as they put the curtain uh, in front of all the auditions and everyone's playing their beautiful instruments, that magically suddenly uh, more women and more people of color uh, suddenly became good enough to uh, to join the orchestras uh, of some of our great uh, 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 some of our great uh, world orchestras. Uh, and so uh, I think there's an opportunity for using the technology of a curtain. Uh, to uh, to introduce uh, or, or to reduce bias, but uh, I'm curious to hear uh, from uh, from whoever feels called uh, to uh, to hear a little more about uh, a little bit of the good on bias, but also a little bit of the challenge on bias, uh, and and where your predictions are uh, over the coming couple of years. Can you all hear me now? Am I? Uh, yeah. 
So yeah, we'll right. answer this Excellent. question and then you're ready to go. So, uh, 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 so perfect. I can also call on you. <laughs> I think one, one thing in my experience that I thought was sort of interesting, we, you know, we, once upon a time, we were hiring engineers. We decided to introduce a blind coding challenge, right? Like you write the code, we look at the code. We haven't met you, you know, in person, the people who are reviewing the code don't know who submitted it. And, uh, and I think one of the things that was sort of interesting about it is we, um, you know, successfully evaluated these sort of coding samples without knowing anything about the folks. And I think hired, made good hires, but we had fewer, uh, we had a more imbalanced hiring year that year than in previous years. And our thought was that we would get maybe more uh, women hiring in particular was what we thought we were correcting for. Uh, if we would just eliminate some of the bias we thought might be in our team. Um, and it just wasn't happening that way. And I, and the thing I think you have to look at is not just your mechanism for how you evaluate, but also how you reach the people that you want to apply for the job. And so when we looked back the numbers, what actually happened is we just had fewer applicants who were women that year by percentage than we did in previous years. And so the next year we, we tried obviously a different approach <laughs> and we brought more women to the front lines of, of recruiting in our organization, right? And go out and meet the people we want to hire. And uh, so I think one fear I have with trying to automate that, like getting rid of bias, is there are things that sound really good in, in abstract, and then when you apply them in the real world, you know, there may be un, unanticipated messages you're sending to the people that you're interacting with that turn them off or cause them to not engage, right? And so I think one thing you have to do is make sure you still engage with those people that you don't want to have a bias against, right? I love that. So, Krista, Krista, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to say that I think the thing that's probably, you know, we've been talking particularly this last year a lot about this issue. And I think one of the things that's particularly problematic for people, and I think they have a difficult time dealing with, is that this is a very deep, entrenched problem, which means that it's going to require multiple interactions over a long period of time with a lot of dedication to get past it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so examples like, you know, reaching out to certain groups for hiring, you know, where are you looking? That's a great point. Um, but also, you know, why is it perhaps that there's fewer people who might be qualified to do that in the first place? And that requires going two steps even farther back. And I think that's, I think we, we are in a, a world where we tend to like to fix problems quickly, but this is one that I am quite convinced that's not going to be fixed quickly. And I think that that's the reality and I think, you know, there's a lot of people who feel that, you know, if we talk about it too much after a while, we get tired of the discussion, right? Mm. But unfortunately, that can't happen. You know, this, we're going to have to talk about this for years before we <laughs> resolve this. And, we, and that helps us come up with new ideas, right? That engagement and discussion, we say, oh, well, maybe this didn't work. Let's try this. And that's how we kind of move forward. Right. No, I, I, I think both of you are spot on on this. And I think also coming back to... Uh, to uh, uh, to our, our first example from Scott is uh, we are pattern recognizing creatures, right? The default mode center of our brain sits there sorting through patterns. And I think that we can look at someone and say like, okay, I, they're different than me. They look different than me. And I'm going to choose to solve, move that pattern out. That one's actually easier than this person writes code exactly how I would. This person approaches the question exactly how I would. That's good code. Uh, that pattern recognition is probably a little harder to see, uh, and uh, and you're just going to end up with uh, sameness that's actually harder to identify. Actually, there's yeah. a little bit more. Um, I mean, it's amazing points that 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 um, that everyone made here. Uh, I wanted to add something that's a little bit more upstream to that. Even you, you know, we were talking about the hiring example and, and coding and interview process. Uh, job descriptions inherently have bias in them. So, you know, uh, how we write job descriptions, the personality, the persona that we project about this particular person um, you know, that we want to hire, and sometimes inadvertently, you know, mentioning even gender through the course, course of the job description, uh, attributes, traits that have high correlation to one type, um, you know, ethnograph or, or gender versus the other. Uh, are all contributing to this. Now, back again, there are technologies like Textio that are actually that lead through this and identify intrinsic bias within the job descriptions themselves. But at mm -hmm. the same time, if, you know, you said we are pattern recognition humans, similarly, as, as Scott runs this 
you know, robotic automation and artificial intelligence companies. There are there is supervised learning and unsupervised learning in in artificial intelligence. And if you feed a lot of unsupervised learning, then the intrinsic bias is going to perpetuate through that particular the, through the machine. The machine is going to do what people hundreds and thousands of years back have, have done progressively as data points, assuming that that is true. So there is uh, bias has an, uh, we have to actively manage it, particularly when it comes to uh, machine learning capabilities. But there is also the goodness side of like, you know, machine learning capabilities where we can identify bias and correct it, like, you know, through some of these tools that I've mentioned that identifies mm -hmm. it in our description. Beautiful. Thank you, Karthik. Okay, Matt, I'm not going to introduce you again because uh, I thought I did a great job. Uh, but uh, we, we, we'd love to hear your, your opening remarks as we uh, move into sure. the back half of our conversation. Sure. I mean, I mean, look, it's, uh, it's always ironic when you're on a, a panel about if digital technologies are making us better and you can't really speak given the digital technology. Yeah. But, uh, but I, think the, uh, I, think, I think this piece that we were talking about are what does technology do with bias is really relevant to a central question that we're talking about is, you know, it's funny when I was at the white house and then at the defense department, you know, my job at the defense department was basically showing up at work every day and planning for war, you know, which is a really interesting day job. And uh, you plan for war because you don't want it to actually happen. You try to deter enemies who want to do the world harm. And we had this really probably optimistic view that technology would really be ultimately a helpful force. We looked at the Arab Spring, and it was the democratizing power of technology that allowed people to organize against autocratic governments. We talked about the power of technology to allow us to try to more precisely drop humanitarian relief into Syria or into Yemen. And if you had left the Obama administration uh, and you were to work in Google or at Amazon or Facebook, you were sort of seen as just continuing the great work that the administration was trying to do. And then unfortunately, what we really found is swinging forward is those same technologies became really a way for autocrats to really oppress their citizens. You know, rather than democratizing what we could do, digital technologies became the great panopticon and a way to observe what people were doing at any time. And I think what we see now is it went from a swing that digital technology, the democratizing optimistic force, to only can be done for bad. And I think now we need to really arise at this middle part now to understand like most things, and I think others have talked about this, is technology is just an extension of what we put into it. And now what I really struggle with is how can we both stop the negative effects of technology? And I think governments really have a role in doing that, but still try to find that creativity that I got so excited about a number of other things. Um, and I think, you know, what others have mentioned here so far is two things that we might think about how to do that are, one, I think the thing that technology does in a really profound way is it helps the private sector solve problems that the government may want to solve, but is really bad at doing that. And that's really a way to really foster better and more creative solutions than what just a monopoly on the use of power and use of force can do. And then the second piece is just to really allow us to experiment. And I think as we think about kind of going between the technology for all good to technology really making us worse human beings, for us to kind of think about how to find those techniques to really edge us along in a better way uh, to some of these really enormous problems we've all been dealing with. Fantastic. So many good points. I think that, you know, we're, uh, one question I have for you though, sort of diving in, there's two things, I decided to choose one uh, that I want to dive into. And one for you, Matt, is uh, on this idea about identifying the negative sides. I mean, you were a strategist trying to figure out the, all the negative things that could possibly happen by various, uh, you know, state actors or non-state actors. And so you're doing right. this. But if we look broadly at either uh, at a specific technology and, and how it connect, how does one go about identifying these, generating awareness without creating a kind of fear that either ends the technology or stunts it? You know, Dave, you, you asked the key question. Um, and I think the way I might think about it just from a more historical perspective is we're always fighting the last war. You know, what that means is when we looked at how do you deal with, uh, with Vietnam? We were trying to fight World War I, World War II with overwhelming force. You know, when we looked at before 9-11, people were defending against hijackers of airplanes. No one thought everyone would try to learn how to fly an airplane but not land it. 
and we really have the same issue now. I, I think the things we're guarding against in the government right now is how do you stop us, the United States government, but also other Australians and the UK and the France and other NATO allies, how do you stop us from selling uh, really dangerous technology to other countries? And we think of them as missiles, cyber weapons, and other pieces. No one thought that the most dangerous technology might just be commercial apps, things that would take our data, uh, use in ways that we never expected, and allow it to weaponize against us. So I think for us to think about your question, probably the best example is to take a page from science fiction, use our imagination and creativity, and maybe have the bold thing to try to do, which strategists and planners and leaders have not really done is, rather than fighting the last war, how do we think about what's really to come? Because technology is really about imagination ultimately, but when we think about how to use it, we're still really drowning in the past. No, super good point. And you know, I'm, I'm always reminded of uh, either true or apocryphal stories of, of Hollywood creatives uh, being engaged by the Department of Defense to try and understand what on earth could happen. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, predictions from, uh, authors like Michael Crichton, uh, to, uh, you know, to people who are, you know, working on, you know, whether it's a war movie or, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, or just an action film, uh, to try and, and guess what might happen in these scenarios. Uh, yeah. you know, but now we live in a time of, uh, of, uh, you know, a lot of Netflix series that are just trying to stoke an awful lot of fear. Uh, you know, uh, the social dilemma was number one for a long time. Uh, and, uh, that's almost a little bit too late because we've already, like, we've already given in. Uh, and you, you might feel bad about, you know, choosing to search on Google and let them read your email, uh, and spend all, all the time that one does on Instagram. Um, but, uh, but they've been good teaching moments, but they're just sort of fear without a great action. Uh, and I think it's really interesting sort of to tie a little bit uh, from uh, what Karthik shared and also uh, from, from Matt, just in this world of mental health. You know, next year, psychedelics are going to start being legal at a federal level, right? They're legal in different areas. Uh, you can legally go have magic mushrooms as part of a therapy just 200 miles from my house in Oregon. Uh, and these are things where there's a lot of fear. It's institutionalized, actually created fears uh, for medications uh, you know, one of my good friends runs uh, trauma for the Veterans Administration, uh, where they have uh, we have a million U.S. veterans with PTSD who are receiving benefits from PTSD. And here is taking, you know, one or two sessions of MDMA uh, or magic mushrooms seems to cure it for, you know, two thirds of those individuals. But there's going to be a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation and a lot to overcome. And so whether it's whether it's magic mushrooms or it's uh, or you know robotics or if it's AI that are going to be helping us in our lives in more meaningful ways than my Alexa does, I'm curious how we should address looking at the future concerns while also uh, you know sort of addressing those proactively. Um, so uh, pick your topic, but would love to go around uh, and, and hear from you. I think that uh, one of the things that I, I want to mention is that I think the, the process of how we we innovate, I, I think there's a really important thing to look at there because, you know, in most of my career, I've worked with large companies. And I think now if you look at, you know, our tech giants there, you know, they came from the world of the startup, but they're very much large companies now. And when companies get to a certain size, it, it's it's very clear that that voices that kind of stand up, the scenario analysis people, the people who say, oh, this thing might happen. You know, those people aren't necessarily always part of the conversation. So I think that it's really important to make sure that organizations have within them people who are the ones that kind of raise the, the flag, right? And not the white flag, but the flag of, mm, you know, this is the direction that we might go in. And that's a problematic direction. And we need to make sure we put in place the guardrails or some type of system or process to help us protect against that. Now, we mm. do know that there's a lot of external pressure increasingly. So from investors, for example, the whole ESG movement's been very strong. And that also has a little bit to do with this as well. So there's external pressure. But I think we need to make sure we always have in teams people who are that voice. That's very important. Absolutely. 
No, I think that's really good perspective. I think the other the other thing that just as as people that we can do for each other is maybe have more empathy for the people who are affected by these changes as they are happening or as we start to see them happening. And I think right now there's, and maybe I can only speak from the U S perspective really intelligently, but it seems like in the U S we are entirely too, um, I just, we, we don't show enough empathy for people who are affected. We're too kind of, um, uh, cold in that treatment. And it leaves people feeling much more insecure, even if they haven't been personally affected, they can see it coming, right? Or they see the fear of it coming. And, uh, you know, you saw a lot of that when COVID hit and people had to stay home. A lot of the resistance to, to that was because, well, well, I'm not going to get paid and I won't have health insurance. And we as a, as a country didn't institute policies to protect people from the health and safety rules that we're putting in place on them. And that's a, an example that isn't necessarily technology, but technology has the same, you know, digitization can have the same kind of effects on corners of our economy at a time. And I think we need to really think from a public policy point of view about how we help people bridge from where they are to the next thing. And mm. uh, we don't do that nearly enough, I think. Well, we're getting uh, prepared for it now because we've displaced so many people uh, from the workforces of various countries uh, for a number of jobs that are simply not going to come back. Uh, so this is our, our, our testing grounds. They were sort of uh, displaced by just a, a new reality as, as we've switched, uh, uh, which is either going to help speed the change or, or multiply the, the hurt and the, and the negative impact that could... Uh, uh, that could come. So, uh, uh, Karthik, for you, as you look at this, uh, whether it's the world of, of automation or just where we find ourselves after a year of pandemic, uh, what are your predictions for uh, how this is going to affect society? Um, on one hand, I see this as an accelerant. So, in other words, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like, you know, um, the gas was in the bottle. You just shook up the bottle and, and opened the cork, right? Like, so and it just mm-hmm. fizzed up much faster within this. So the goodness in the society and uh, the acceleration um, of some of these uh, changes and for that matter, the device in the divisiveness in the society uh, are all just being amplified circumstantially and contextually because of technology and because of, uh, of, of these uncontrollable events, um, you know, such as, such as the pandemic, uh, so to speak, within that. Uh, so fundamentally, I, I see this, the pandemic as an accelerant to e- everything that was in slow motion is now in like fast forward uh, real quick adoption of uh, adoption of technology for, for remote working, um, virtualization um, at a much higher level, chasing right. productivity uh, to a greater level, divisiveness uh, it, 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 with people being on the edges and, and Twitter wars, uh, so on and so forth, are just being amplified under stress. Uh, than anything else. Um, that said, it's also relatively inelastic uh, in such a way that, like, it, it, you know, beyond a particular point, it's not going to snap back to its original shape after the pandemic. And so, some form of this stretch mark is going to, you know, continue remaining uh, for us. And the more we recognize that, and the more we, uh, you know, sort of reorient ourselves to the new reality, the better off it'll it'll be mm. for everyone. So there is, if, if anyone's feeling a spring action back to, you know, the March 10th, uh, 2020, I, I believe that they're going to be in for a disappointment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and not for me, though, because I had a 104 fever on March 10th uh, oh, for the run for five days, which turned out to not be COVID, but it was plenty yeah. scary at the moment. Uh, yeah. So I don't remember that day very well. Uh, so just in our last minutes that we have here, I want to go Matt, Trista, and Karthik. Uh, if you had one request, your policy request, your wish list that could actually help technology make us better human beings, more whole human beings, what would that be? Matt, Trista, Karthik. The lightning round. You can say pass. Mm. <laughs> pass. I'll pass. 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 Trista. Trista. Oh, that's, I mean, have so many things, right? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that would be, I, I would love is something, and I think it's really difficult to find the right balance, but certainly something that helps us validate information a little bit better. 
Um, I, I don't really know how to do that in a way to make sure that people's speech is is um, it's, it's respected because I, I respect that as well. But it just has to stop at some point. You know, at some point, like when somebody's looking back a hundred years from now, what will be right. the truth? <laughs> so, I think that's Love something that I think that we really need. Love it, Karthik. Uh, you know, normalize or uh, uh, neutralize power concentration. So more federated, more uh, uh, more uh, democratized, uh, more access uh, to any form of technology, whether it's fintech, which is moving and managing money, or whether it is uh, whether it is uh, social tech or whether it is genetic te uh, tech, wherever it is, uh, where it, things are not concentrated to to the haves, uh, but it's much more democratized uh, to the have-nots in a federated model, be it identity, be it uh, be it uh, you know core logic, what have you. Wonderful. Okay, Matt. Second time around. That's Scott. <laughs> oh, Scott. Sorry. That's <laughs> oh, sorry. 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 Took me a minute to figure out you meant me. Um, yeah, no, I think the policy stuff, I think, is tough. I think that um, we're just out of whack, right, between sort of the, the power structure between the big tech companies and our ability to regulate them. And I think some uh, a quick change I would make, if I could, is to say that you you can have companies be held accountable for the editorial decisions that they make, not for the content, but for the editorial decisions. So if I block your content, then you'd have some recourse to you know, pursue in the court and say, hey, you're discriminating against my contact, content or what have you. But I think largely the, the companies would win on those <laughs> on those choices. But I think it would make it more clear that they have both a, a right and a consequence to make those editorial decisions. Great. So uh, uh, so we're going to get a, a rewrite of Section 230 uh, of, the, of the Federal Communications Act and Decency Act. We're going to democratize and keep it create access to everything. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to, I want to come back, Trista, to one of your original points. 